Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the SITREP Podcast Channel, your forward operations space for all things military and historical wargaming. I'm your host today, Oriskany Jim, and today we are going to hit the beach to commemorate the June 6th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy, France, part of Operation Overlord in 1944. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the assault beach codenamed Omaha, or as we're going to call it today, Bloody Omaha where we saw the U.S. 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, along with the 29th Infantry Division, hit the beach, supported by all kinds of additional units. There were Rangers in here, all kinds of engineers, Navy demolition groups, U.S. Army Air Force tactical support, U.S. Navy landing ships, of course, U.S. Navy gunfire support. The list just goes on and on and on. Now, they're up against the German 352nd Infantry Division, which has a reputation of being a pretty solid outfit. In fact, it was one of the few real divisions the Allies encountered during the opening day of Overlord. The problem with the 352nd is that only about half of their troops have any kind of real combat experience. The overall German command formation in this region, 84th Army Corps, was using the 352nd as sort of a rotating training cadre, where they would cycle in and out different battalions from the coastal and static infantry divisions that the Germans also had deployed along this stretch of the Atlantic Wall. Now, in this episode, we are going to be recreating all of the initial assaults onto Omaha Beach, including both 1st and 29th U.S. Infantry Division sectors. The system we're going to be using is Panzer Leader by Avalon Hill, along with quite a few fixes and tweaks, mostly imported from the subsequent game in that series, the Arab Israeli Wars. Some of the other tweaks will be of my own design, which we'll go over as the video progresses. This is the largest game of Panzer Leader I have ever played personally, and I've been playing Panzer Leader since 1986. We're talking about well over 450 units, that doesn't include beach obstacles, improved positions, fortifications, all that kind of stuff. We're talking about over 3,000 hexes and 20 turns. In all, this game wound up taking 25 hours. Spoiler alert, that's why we didn't do this one live. The game covers the full breadth of the Omaha Beach Assault Zone, both 1st and 29th U.S. Infantry Divisions. Omaha Beach really was the largest of the five invasion beaches tackled by the Allies on D-Day, and the scenario covers about the first five or six hours of the invasion. So yeah, this game was definitely a bit of a monster. There are a few key features you're going to see in this game. Number one is the scale. On a board this big, we have room to actually lay everything out, there's no kind of logarithmic abstraction for firing ranges or movement rates. You're going to get a real feel for the scale and complexity of the engagement. Number two, we're going to get a real feel for just how weak the Germans actually were. There's only part of one division here, the 352nd, and again, a large number of these troops actually had almost no combat experience. Number three, we're going to get a look at just how difficult it is to actually mount an amphibious operation under fire. 40% of the game for the Americans is simply going to be getting out of the water. They're going to lose a lot of units, especially when it comes to tanks. Number four, we are going to see the absolutely vital role played by combat engineers and Navy combat demolition units. You've got to blow holes in beach obstacles, clear minefields, open up cuts, open up draws, demolish German bunkers. There's a lot of work to be done, and we're going to see a lot of it in today's game. And finally, number five, we are going to see the absolute pivotal role played by naval gunfire support. Now, believe it or not, Omaha Beach was actually pretty weakly supported, at least by Pacific standards, at least at first, with only one battleship, two cruisers, and six destroyers assigned to actually bombard German targets on Omaha Beach. Partway through that first terrible morning, though, it was clear they needed some additional support. USS Texas diverted from her initial target at Point to Ho and came over to support the western end of Omaha Beach, closing to within a mile and a half to absolutely point-blank blast German bunkers clean off this planet. For those of you who know anything about battleships, one and a half miles for a battery of 10 14-inch guns is absurdly close. Some of the American destroyers came within 400 yards of the waterline, again, to provide that pinpoint fire support, and we're definitely going to see some of that in this game. But enough of the background, if you're watching this channel, you probably already know most of this. As they say, 30 seconds out, God be with you. Let's get to the game table and see what we find. Here is our map for our Omaha Beach Assault game. It measures 72 by 42 hexes at 150 meters per hex. That's just under 11 kilometers or six and three quarter miles, 74 square kilometers in all. 
So yeah, I don't think I would recommend trying this in 15mm. You see where the Germans are more or less set up in their historical dispositions? The American first wave is ready to come in. At least they think so. This is where they intend to land. Spoiler alert, there's going to be a big rule for amphibious movement in drift. This drift rule is going to play havoc with the American dispositions and how they actually come onto the beach. Most of those Shermans, these are the DD Shermans, are actually going to sink before they come in. They did not take into account the chop on the English Channel, and yeah, most of them aren't going to make it to the beach at all. The units that do make it to the beach are not going to land anywhere near where they're supposed to. They're going to drift all over Hell's Creation, mostly to the east, because that's the way most of the drift and the current was actually behaving that day. Any American unit that actually makes it to the sand is going to be immediately subject to German beach obstacles. Notice there are no beach obstacle counters on this map, no blocks. It would literally be every single seaside hex would be covered in a block counter. It would be a little cumbersome. So how we're handling that is we're assuming that there are beach obstacles on every single seaside hex. As soon as the Americans hit the sand, they're going to be subject to another dice roll and units can either land in good order, dispersed, or destroyed. The way the Americans get around that is with their engineers, they can open up cuts and we have counters for that. And then if subsequent waves of Americans land on a hex that does have a cut in it, they are not subject to that German beach obstacle rule. All of the beach hexes on the map are pre-sighted by the Germans, so when they're calling in their indirect fire assets, they do not have to wait the normal one turn delay. The Americans, of course, have tons of indirect fire as well in the form of naval gunfire support. Some of that is also going to be instantaneous, depending on exactly what they're targeting. Some of it's going to have to wait one turn or two turns, again, depending on what they're targeting. The Americans also have a swarm of P-47 Thunderbolts for tactical air support, mostly armed with bombs, some with rockets, although there frankly isn't that much German armor on this table. We're also going to have rules for how the Americans can remove these block counters that the Germans have set up in front of all four of the major draws that were historically present on Omaha Beach, as well as cutting gaps through this seawall and shale beach that we see here marked by the darker graphic right here along the foot of the bluffs. We have the historical locations for all the German Wiedersteinnester fortifications. We are again using Arab Israeli war rules for fortifications and improved positions. This is where the Germans have all their best infantry and most powerful direct fire artillery straight down onto the beach. Expect those things to be major priority targets as well as major pain points for the Americans. So long story short, take your first shot. Expect these beaches to turn into absolute chaos. The Americans are gonna have all kinds of opportunity problems, beach obstacle problems, overstacking problems, drifting problems. It's gonna be an absolute nightmare. But the Americans have to get off those killing hexes. Again, every hex there is pre-sighted, especially before more and more American waves and things begin to pile up deeper and deeper on those seaside hexes. Speaking of successive waves, here is our research that shows down to the minute in both of the invasion zones, 29th Infantry and 1st U.S. Infantry, what was supposed to land and exactly when it was supposed to land. Clearly everything in these initial bands is already on the table, but what's going to happen in successive turns of the game is that more and more of these American units are going to come in. Again, we have pretty detailed information on what was coming all the way down to individual companies. All I did was I took each unit and converted it into Panzer Leader units, and I have them sitting here on the schedule. So as these turns continue to roll out in the game, I'm just going to grab these units, I'm going to set them up in their initial sector, and then of course they're subject to the usual drift rules that we described earlier. So yeah, this game is going to be big, it's going to be hairy, it's going to be complicated, and it's going to be a nightmare, especially for the Americans as they try to cross that killing ground down there on the sand. Turn one, H hour and the Americans have hit the beach, for better or worse, mostly for the worse. Let's zoom in and start looking at what's happened so far. Starting off here on the extreme western end of the map, we see where, as predicted, a lot of the American armor has sank, and even those that have made it have come under immediate anti-tank fire, and one platoon of Sherman dozers has been blown off the beach as they came off of their LCT. Some other Shermans have by actually some pretty lucky rolls, actually made it. And they're actually pushing forward onto the beach more or less according to plan. However, American infantry is taking a hell of a pounding. We see here, of course, the unfortunate Able Company 1st Battalion, 116th Regimental Combat Team. 
These are the guys who historically took about 90% casualties in the first five minutes of the assault. I think three small towns somewhere in Virginia more or less lost their whole male generation right there on that beach. We got some P-47s coming in trying to blow some of these uh, German artillery positions out of this Wiedersteinester Nester 71. They've had some success knocking out that 15 centimeter infantry gun. But yeah, American losses are already really bad. Every little smoke column that we're going to have on this map indicates a destroyed American platoon or gun battery. That's about 300 men rendered combat ineffective. They're not all killed, wounded, but a lot of them are. Things don't get much better the further down we go through 116th Regimental Combat Team's assault sector. Again, it's more of the same. These Wiedersteinester Nesser with their heavy artillery are taking opportunity fire as the Americans come out of their assault boats. So per Panzer Leader rules, when a Higgins boat is in the water, it is considered to have a defense factor of eight. It is made out of metal. However, what the Germans are doing is taking opportunity fire as soon as the Americans execute during their movement phase, the actual landing. This is where we see as soon as those ramps went down, the MG42s just poured right down those slots and half of these poor guys didn't even make it off the boat. Like we see this unit here, this was an assault boat that didn't even make it to the beach. It wound up being sunk before it even reached the shore. A lot of these other units were destroyed, if not by German gunfire, by again, those beach obstacles. Down here into the eastern section of the beaches. Here again, the Americans are getting lucky, really, really lucky. They only have a one or a two chance on a D6 to land with their tanks. They have gotten insanely lucky here in the Big Red One's assault zone. Only two of these, actually three, only three of these platoons went down. Yeah, Lady Luck has really come through for the Americans here on the eastern stretch of the beach. Overall, however, things look pretty grim, especially on the western end of the beach, where the Americans are taking probably even more casualties than they took historically. Moving immediately to turn two, we see way more of those little black smoke columns. Lots more Americans have been hit coming out of the water or struggling their way up the beach. Here in front of the Dog 1 exit that leads towards Vierville, the Americans are in a bit of a crossfire here between Wiedersteinester Nester 71 and 72. American tanks are on the beach, so this did not happen historically, at least to any appreciable degree, especially in those early hours. Some American tanks have made it onto the beach and they are putting some direct fire down on these German positions. They're taking anti-tank fire though from some of these German anti-tank positions. Some of them were just old tank turrets repurposed into anti-tank turrets, but they can still kill tanks, and they're definitely causing a lot of problems for the Americans on the beach. You can see here where the Americans are marking their intended artillery strikes, and this is battleships like USS Arkansas and later USS Texas, along with the cruisers and destroyers that are trying to suppress or destroy some of the heavier German positions in these Wiedersteinester blockhouses to prevent them from slaughtering even more Americans out here on the sand. We are seeing some engineering work, however, already in progress, where some of these Shermans with the dozer blades are opening up gaps in the seawall. Germans are starting to see what's going on, though, and they're beginning to selectively target engineer platoons wherever they can. Over here in Big Red 1's assault sector, again, it's a mixed report. American tanks are coming on in numbers way surpassing what happened historically. American infantry is still taking some really, really bad losses. We also see where some of the German infantry is beginning to take some pretty heavy losses, either to American direct tank fire coming off of the beach or the offshore naval bombardment. Now here's an interesting point that we talked about briefly in the introduction, where different units within the German 352nd Infantry have very, very different levels of quality. So we have some standard German late war rifle platoons, we have some pretty badass pioneer or combat engineer platoons, and then we have some of these security platoons, which we are using to represent some of the units drawn in from the static coastal divisions the Germans had also stationed here along the Atlantic Wall. One thing that has gone very well for the Americans here in turn two is a naval gunfire mission has absolutely blasted the Interstat Nester 62. They just got a lucky roll for a change, and yeah, all these German, two German platoons and a gun battery have been completely blown out of that blockhouse. This is going to open up things pretty well for the Americans here on the far eastern end of the thing. A pretty big airstrike has also gone in, along with lots of American tank fire coming off the beach. Yeah, things are not looking good for the Germans over here on the far right wing. Advancing the turn track from turn two to turn three, you see there's not a whole lot of forward movement in most places by the forward American line, but here along the water's edge, we see where that second big wave has finally arrived, along with a whole new series of smoke columns. 
because the American engineers have not done the best job so far in opening up gaps in German beach obstacles. They're mostly focused on the minefields and even advancing towards the blockhouses that are leading into the draws, the four major draws. Here's one, here's two, here's three, and here's four that the Americans have to clear in order to win the game. They might be getting a little bit ahead of themselves is what I'm trying to say. Starting off over here at Bloody Veerville, we see where a very important unit has been hit by German artillery and blown up before it even reaches the table. This is the headquarters and service company of 116th Regimental Combat Team. We may have just killed Brigadier General Coda, Assistant Divisional Commander of the 29th Infantry. This is the Robert Mitchum character in The Longest Day. That's probably going to have some pretty bad effects. The Americans do get a morale check to see if either Brigadier General Coda has survived or whether a member of his staff can take over. They do pass that check. This is a Morale B unit. Again, we're using the morale rules from Arab-Israeli Wars here in our Panzer Leader scenario. So although this was a very, very tense moment for the American player, they came through it relatively unscathed. We're also calling in a massive battleship strike here on Wiederstein Esther 71 that has absolutely been taking a grim harvest on American units here on Dog Green and even extending here into Dog White. Moving further along here to the east, we see where Wiederstein Esther 66 has definitely seen better days. That has been blown pretty much off the face of the earth again by another battleship strike. So things here in the American center are hopefully going to get a little bit easier. Historically, the Americans also caught a bit of a break here when naval gunfire support actually started an unexpected brush fire here in the center of the invasion beach and created something of an unexpected smokescreen that actually managed to dilute a little bit of the German fire coming down on the beaches. Here's some more good news coming out of Big Red One's assault sector. Overall, 1st U.S. Infantry is doing much better than 29th Infantry, to be honest. And what's happened here is that these engineers managed to open up a gap here in this minefield. You see the open counter there. They were then immediately pinned down by all the German infantry fire coming out of this position here at Peter Sennes, or 65. But that was after they opened up this gap in the minefield. Two American Sherman platoons managed to outflank the block. One of them did wind up getting pinned down by this battery of 7.5 centimeter anti-tank guns. That's okay. The point is, the Americans have actually managed to occupy their very first objective hex. So there's 11 objective hexes on the table. The Americans need to take at least seven of them to win the game. So far, they've taken one, although let's not kid ourselves. This draw is really not open. There's still minefields in front of it. And most importantly, this block is still here. So the Americans are going to have to take care of these beach obstacles. Like we said in the introduction, combat engineers are the real trump card here in this game. They're going to have to clear out those obstacles before that draw is considered open. Heading from turn three over into turn four, the Americans just still can't buy a break over here in the Beerville sector. They did call in that huge battleship strike that we were talking about before. It had no effect. The Americans whiffed that roll on a six, and things are not doing so hot. Now here we do have our little Saving Private Ryan moment, where we have Charlie Company, 2nd Ranger Battalion. That's pretty much considered to be Tom Hanks' unit in Saving Private Ryan. They're not attacking exactly where they did historically or where they did in the movie, but they are now up on the bluffs, and they are starting to curl around between German positions and assault some of these improved positions. So these are foxholes, slit trenches. It's not the big blockhouses, but like we see in the movie where they're moving down those trenches and shooting up Germans as they go, they've kind of started to do that, along with supporting elements of what's left of Abel and Baker Company's 116th Regimental Combat Team. We actually have some tank overruns and some combat engineers supported close assaults happening here on the bluffs further to the east. And yeah, long story short, take your second shot. The further east you go on this map, the better things look for the Americans. Over there in front of Veerville, it's an absolute massacre. Probably even worse than it was historically, especially once that battleship strike failed. But over here, it's getting better and better. So, hey, what can I say? The Big Red One has definitely eaten their Wheaties this morning, and they are bringing it to the table. Clicking forward into turn five, we now find that the third big American wave has landed, again, with all kinds of beach obstacle problems. And they're starting to run out of luck with their airstrikes. We actually have a P-47 that was shot down by a German flag. What the P-47s are trying to do is range way back and take out some of this German artillery. Because that pre-sighted German artillery rule has been absolutely murderous here on these beaches. 
they are causing untold carnage. You see all these, again, all these little smoke columns is a platoon or battery destroyed. They're making better progress as far as actual geographical progress down the beach, up on the bluffs, and into the German fortifications, but they are paying an even higher cost than we saw in the already horrific casualty rates on Omaha Beach. And a lot of it has been to that German artillery. So those P-47s are trying to do something about it. Even if they've used up their bombs and rockets, their mass 50 caliber machine gun can still tear up an unarmored 10.5 centimeter battery pretty efficiently. But they are starting to pay a cost. Again, here we have another, I take that back, there were two P-47 shot down. One here in the center and one over here on the left. So yeah, the Germans are definitely not giving up so far. I can promise you that. Turn five bleeds into turn six. We are now an hour and a half in and some cracks are finally beginning to develop, especially over here to the west. So over here near the Veerville draw, we are seeing another Saving Private Ryan type assault. Now this is the actual moment that we see in the Saving Private Ryan movie where we see elements of, you see these Ranger platoons here, Charlie Company, 2nd Ranger Battalion, along with elements of, again, Abel and Baker Company's 116th Regimental Combat Team, are launching this final assault onto Biederstad Nestor 7. So here's where Doyle is warming up his flamethrower. Now, this last platoon of German Pioneers is only pinned down. You see it's kind of knocked off on an angle there. They haven't actually been eliminated yet. This battle is ongoing. The Rangers don't actually crack that position on their first assault. Some other good signs over here at the Beerville draw, the Sherman Dozer Blades. There's this one, and then there's this guy, and these two of them together punch their way across to the shale part of the beach into the seawall, and they have literally been eating their way down like little armored termites. They have opened up a gap 900 yards wide for follow-on waves to start making their way onto shore and up the beach. Moving further to the east, we see where decent elements of 2nd and 3rd Battalions of 116th Regimental Combat Team, G and K Company specifically, are starting to mass up for a hell of a cat attack here on Peterstein Nestor 70. They have to go up those bluffs though, it's going to be a rough ride making that scale and assaulting that position. Heading over into Big Red 1's territory, we have a major breach. So not only have the Americans blown that block and actually opened up that last minefield, they've now pretty much secured that objective hex we were looking at last turn, and they have now moved those first two platoons forward and they've occupied a second objective hex. So this third draw is now officially open. In game terms, in order for these draws to be considered open, each one of the four draws has an objective hex at its mouth and an objective hex at its summit. And the Americans have to control both of them in order to open up that draw. Here they've done it. They own both of the objective hexes on this third draw, number one and number two. They've cleared both minefields and the block that was actually covering it. Those were often walls of concrete, sometimes up to 50 feet thick. But the engineers have got it done. They've blown that thing sky high. And yeah, that draw is now open. And way over here to the extreme right, this draw is pretty much busted open. The Americans don't have the second objective hex yet. Here it is way back there but they have the better part of, it looks like at least two companies of tanks. If anything has gone especially well for the Americans in this game, a lot has gone wrong. It has been their tanks. Survival and landing rates among the two American tank battalions that were supposed to support this assault has been far, far above what we saw historically. And it has made a hell of a difference here on the table. To be honest, over here in the Big Red One sector, we're not seeing Omaha Beach as it happened at all. We saw Omaha Beach as it was planned. If things had actually gone according to plan, this is probably the kind of thing we would have seen on Omaha Beach. Moving from turn six then over here to turn seven. Yep, we are looking at another big block that has now been blown open by the Americans. Again, over here at Bloody Beerville. It took three platoons of engineers to get it done, but hey, that's three rolls on the engineering table and apparently at least one of them has succeeded. Things aren't going completely okay for the Americans. This Panzer Shrek section has managed to torpedo a platoon of Shermans. So we've got some American wreck counters on the table. But here we have Mr. John Miller has finally managed to carry that assault on it. It took him two tries, but here we do see that Peter Sandmester 71 is finally empty. They finally took that bunker and the guns have started to fall silent here over the majority of Dahl Green. 
Making things even worse for the Germans, yet another wave of Americans has now landed. Although again, with so many engineers pushing up onto the bluffs, there are no engineers left behind to clear out these beach obstacles. Every turn we click through, you see more and more of these black columns. The Americans are doing very well as far as the time schedule, as far as taking objectives, but they have done a very poor job at clearing these beach obstacles. Long story short, take your third shot. They are taking way too many unnecessary casualties here along the water's edge. Moving on now to turn eight. You see where, yeah, the Americans are getting very, very serious with direct fire. I'll zoom in on that section so we can see it a little bit better about knocking out these last positions. There's all kinds of, look at this, I can't even count how many units are now opening fire point blank onto this Wiederstein nester. Again, those things are built I'm built to last, let's just put it that way. They've only managed to pin down one weak German platoon in there. Meanwhile, two pretty serious German platoons are dusting off their shoulders. So like, is that all you've got? But the Americans are again amassing more and more engineers and rifle platoons at the foot of the bluffs. It's tough to close assault up a bluff, but the Americans are trying to make it happen. Now we do see where the Americans are finally starting to work their way back and open up some of these beaches. So it took a while for the Americans to kind of clue in to the fact that they're going to lose this game on casualty points if they don't leave some engineers behind to start clearing these beach obstacles. There's a certain logic to how the Americans were playing. It's tough to have engineers work on clearing beach obstacles while they're being scissored apart by MG42 fire. But now that the Germans have been cleaned out of a lot of these Wiedersteinnester that are overlooking off of the bluffs down onto the assault beaches, the engineers in the follow-on waves the initial engineers are on the bluffs and they're moving inland. But the follow-on waves also have their own engineer battalions coming on. They're hanging back a little bit and they're opening up some of these gaps in the German beach obstacles in order to make things a little bit easier. Here's another one here. So again, if an American unit now lands on this seaside hex, they are not going to be subject to those German beach obstacles. That's what's been causing most of these smoke columns that you see just lining the water's edge. So hopefully we will see some of those American casualties along the water's edge finally start to thin out as we move further into the game. Well folks, there we are so far. Suffice it to say, they're calling it Bloody Omaha for a damn good reason. In fact, in some places on the table, American losses are even worse than they were historically. Some other places though, the Americans are doing better in particular with their tanks. Even though I gave American armor a pretty poor chance to land safely to reflect some of the very bad decisions made when launching those DD tanks, quite a bit of American armor has safely made it onto the sand and is not only providing good fire support, but the tanks with the dozer blades are opening up some great gaps in German beach obstacles, minefields, and even the seawall. All these obstacles that the American infantry have to contend with there on the sand. Is this luck going to hold out? You're going to have to come back next week and check out part two of this episode. But that's where we're going to leave it for today, folks. Thanks very much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed this content. And remember to hit that notification bell. Also, please consider joining the SITREP Podcast Discord. There is an auto-accept invite link to our Discord in the description of this video. Click the link, join the community, see what everybody else is up to, and even better, show us what's going on on your hobby table. But for now, we are rounds complete for another episode. This is a Risky New Gym with the Sit Rep Podcast. And as always, thank you, Mike, for watching.